Christmas Eve, but we need to do four Sunday about Brentford before we swap over to Christmas. <laughs> Good morning. Anyway, so grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. I'm just going to say a prayer. God of our days and years, we set this time apart for you. Form us in the likeness of Christ, so that our lives may glorify you. Amen. And so we sing, the angel Gabriel from heaven. Jesus is the light of the world. And the light of the world is <laughs> And so we sing, Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming, the church is about to sing. And let the advent candles brightly burning ring. The first is for the promise to put the mountains right. Thank you. 
look of the Passover journeys. Just one or two, I won't be doing them all. Monday the 18th, we collected the Holy Family and their entourage from Margaret, admiring the view over the river from her flat. We thought they all deserved a treat, so we took them to the best coffee shop in New Brighton, Cafe Cream, for a cappuccino and toasted tea cake. We set them out on our table and soon many of the customers came over to see and admire. They wanted to know how we had come to display the posada and we explained about how our church members were hosting them and taking them into various establishments in the town. We were asked which church we were from and we were able to point out the striking spire at St James. Whilst this was going on, to our surprise and delight, Heather and George came into Cafe Cream for a late breakfast and took photos of us and the Posada with the marine lake and lighthouse in the background. Suitably refreshed, we took the Holy Family and their entourage back to our house, where they spent the rest of the day on the windowsill watching the passers-by on Ralston Drive. And being seen by the passers-by, the next morning, we WhatsApped our neighbours to invite them to come and visit the family. And our neighbours came in and were so impressed. So they've been shopping. They've been to Pet Horton Castle for afternoon tea, wherever that is. Not <coughs> there. Has anybody been here? Yeah. Yeah. Chester. Chester. They've been to swim swimming wells. <laughs> <laughs> and then yesterday, Albert and Fred picked up the Holy Family en route to Tranmere Rovers versus Swindon Town. I think they enjoyed the atmosphere and certainly the vision. They later on all snuggled up on the sofa, for it's a wonderful life. I'm back to church now. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. To him who has power to make your standing sure, according to the gospel I brought you and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, According to the revelation of that divine secret kept in silence for long ages, but now disclosed, and through prophetic scriptures by eternal God's command made known to all nations, to bring them to faith and obedience. To God, who alone is wise through Jesus Christ, be glory for endless ages. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. I think Megan is going to go into Sunday school, so let's pray for her. <coughs> Father God, we thank you for Megan and ask your blessing upon her and upon Sarah. And Lord, we pray for all children in our parish this day. Let your Holy Spirit be at work within their families. And let them come to know your love for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to sing the hymn that's based on the Magnificat, Tell Out My Soul, the Greatness of the Lord. <coughs>
going to St. Luke, chapter 1, beginning to read on the 26th verse. In the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <coughs> Amen. Well, here we are, the story of the Annunciation. We hear it twice a year, uh, once usually in Advent at some point, and of course on the Feast of the Annunciation itself. And interestingly, it's the only explicit reference to Jesus' virginal conception in the Bible. It's likely that Matthew, in his account, intends the same sort of thing, but he never explicitly says so. So if we didn't have Luke, we would have no doctrine of the virginal conception. Can I just take a quick digression here, because it was just very recently I heard somebody refer to this as the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. It is not. So let me just briefly tell you, the Immaculate Conception is a Roman Catholic doctrine which says that Mary was miraculously born without the taint of original sin, which your mum passed on to you and have a work with her afterwards. Because that meant that she was able to have a child without, who would not have the taint of original sin. As many of my Catholic friends have pointed out to me, this is the most superfluous doctrine ever to be invented because what was to stop God miraculously stopping Jesus from being born with original sin anyway, instead of having to do it to his mum? But it's there, it's now, since the 19th century, part of Catholic dogma, and that's what it means. So the Immaculate Conception is all about Mary being sinless. I know a good joke about that, but I'll tell you over coffee. <coughs> So here we are, here is Mary, age unknown, <clears throat> parental name unknown, social status unknown, legend has filled all those days. She was a teenage girl with the daughter of, I forget the parents' names, but they're in the book somewhere, and she was brilliant at spinning, and she was really the, um, she, she won the ball at college at school by being so brilliantly wonderful. You know, she's just an exemplary child. We don't know any of that. All we know is that Mary was betrothed to a guy, an artisan named Jacob and Joseph, and there she was in Nazareth. And an archangel comes to visit her. Uh, Luke only actually says angel, but archangel is elsewhere mentioned about a Gabriel, so we can give him his full title. 
And if you are a first century reader, as soon as you see a story like this, your ears prick up. Because you know that stories of miraculous births mean that we are dealing with a very important person here. There's a wonderful biography of Alexander the Great, which tells us that Alexander was the son of Philip of Macedon and his queen, but he was also the son of Apollo, who had an affair with Philip's wife because that was a way of saying that Alexander was an incredibly important person. And the readers of Alexander's biography had no problem whatsoever seeing two alternative accounts of Jesus' birth, uh, of Alexander's birth, in the same narrative. And incidentally, it's quite likely that when Luke first wrote his gospel and included that <coughs> genealogy of who Jesus' ancestors were, that he had a similar sort of idea. But then the story of the Annunciation and the Virgin Birth came along. And his main purpose was to let anybody reading this gospel from the onset know that here we are in the territory of a really, really important figure, a figure blessed by God, one who can be described as the Son of the Most High God. Incidentally, while we're at it, the notion that Jesus was divine, which incidentally we, I do believe, um, does not depend on this story. This came probably much, well, the story was written down and circulated probably quite a long time after Christians first started believing that Jesus was divine. So here we are, we're in special territory. Jesus, this amazing character, is about to be born. And Mary, in the story, quite recently said, well, um, actually, how is this going to happen since the normal requirements of pregnancy have not been fulfilled? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And those words take us right back to the start of the Bible. Right in the opening verses of the book of Genesis, where we read that darkness covered the face of the deep, while the Spirit of God swept over the face of the waters, or hovered over the deep, or however you want to put it. Luke is saying, here, with the coming of Jesus, the power of the creation itself is being brought once more into play. There is a new creation about to take place. The conception of Jesus is not simply a miracle. It is God remaking his work. It is God beginning the process of rebuilding what has been marred. The Gospel of John takes up a similar theme, remember? We'll be hearing it shortly, in the next few days. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and to all who received him, as Mary received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. A new creation is taking place. A new creation that takes place through Jesus and is the work of the Spirit of creation. The Spirit who will turn out to be of such importance in Luke's Gospel as it proceeds. Mary's encounter with Jesus is of course unique. Jesus takes flesh within her body and comes to her in form and physical form and through him, her emerges into the world. But others who encounter Jesus also find that Jesus engenders a new life in them, comes to birth in their lives, and brings to them a new creation, and folds them into that kingdom of God, in which God is making a new humanity. Where will that lead? For Mary, we're going to follow her, in brief installments through the life of Jesus to the cross and beyond. But what about us? If the new creation takes root in our lives, where will that lead? 
will it lead to a life of discipleship, a life of witness, to living out a calling to embody this new creation, to see the world in a new way, and to live by a new set of rules and a new set of values, to live with a changed perspective of life, the world, and with a message of hope to share with those around us. It's no accident that we are gives to Mary a new song. For God has done a new thing. He's brought about a new creation. And so she cries out, my soul praises the Lord, magnifies the Lord. And declares that in this new creation, he challenges the power systems of the world, lifting up the lowly and casting down the mighty feeding the hungry and humbling the proud. And when Jesus begins his ministry, another chapter or so on in the Gospel, he does it by quoting the manifesto from Isaiah, that here is the year of the Lord's favour, the year of granting new vision, of granting freedom from oppression and respite from captivity. This new creation is a revolutionary change that calls those who are part of it to revolutionary ways. It is not part of the same old. Sadly, it has often been conscripted that way. The church has seen itself cast into the pattern of the world's power structures. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church, for instance, invented whole hierarchies of people you know, like cardinals and monsignors and things like that, to mirror the secular dukes and counts and barons and things, so that it could show to the world that it too was a power to be reckoned with. But always within it, there have been the voices of revolution, the founders of the monasteries, the ones who kicked against the traces, the ones who said that this actual new vision is not about following the path of the power of the power of the world, but of challenging it and proclaiming the might of humanity and the call to justice for those who are oppressed and downtrodden. It is to this new creation that we are invited. It is in the light of this new creation that we are called to live out our lives as Mary was to live out her life following in the footsteps of her son. So Mary says, Here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her, we're told. And we often hear what seems to me a large amount of rather pious nonsense about this. Was Mary really being given a choice about whether Jesus was going to be born? I've heard quite a few servants that say, yes, it all depended on this young, it all was young. I like to think of Mary as a sort of middle-aged lady who'd been left on the shelf and on the final trying to with Joseph, just to be different. I don't know if that's any more true than the teenage girl who was driven to spinning, but what the heck. Was it really up to her? Well, you could say God wants to chosen someone who would say no. Or if your Calvinist got preordained that she would say yes, or that God would only come to her knowing what she was going to say already, none of which seems to me to be real choice for the woman. Now, what seems to me to be going on is that the angel is coming to Mary and saying, Hey Mary, bad hair day, because uh, you're about to get pregnant and nobody's going to believe you as that is. And she says, she doesn't say why, interestingly. She says how, and she's told. And then she says, okay then. <coughs> Not that she necessarily has a choice in whether it will happen, but she does have a choice in how she responds. And when you think about it, that makes a pretty much the pattern for all of us. We like to think we're in charge of our lives, don't we? And we really know in our heart of hearts that we're not. 
our lives can be upended at any moment by disaster or by triumph. You can win the lottery. It won't make a change to me. It would make a change to me, I can tell you. Uh, and God, you know, I've met him half, I tried meeting him halfway once buying a, buying a ticket, but he wasn't playing. <laughs> and you can be offended <coughs> by a sudden illness, by disaster, by bereavement, by bankruptcy, by riches, by all kinds of things. Things change. And you have very little control over it. But what you do have control over is whether you go into it kicking and screaming and raging against a pile of fortune. Or whether you say, here I am God, take me through this. Give me the strength to face trials. Give me the hope and the faith to put my trust in you. Enable me to live my life, whatever may come, in the light of your hope and your love. And that, I think, is the choice that Mary makes. She says, still be it then. I am the servant of the Lord. And whatever the Lord sends me, whether I understand it or not, whether I like it or not, I will trust him. I will trust him to see me through it. I will trust him to give me the strength to cope with it. I will trust him to show that somewhere in here is the good that will benefit me and those around me. And I may not always see it. <coughs> But it will be there, that, perhaps with that wondrous joy of hindsight. So, here we are, looking at the story of Mary, and seeing someone in whom the new creation takes root, and opening ourselves, we pray, to that new creation as well. Here we look at Mary, having her life upended, and saying, yes, God, that can happen. But whatever happens, let it be according to your will, for I am your servant. So this Christmas, I'm sure we'll be singing one of my favourite hymns. And there are some words in it that it seems to me we should take really seriously. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in earth today. Thank you, Marcus. Shall we stand to affirm our faith? <coughs> we say together in faith, Holy, 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 holy is, is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We believe in God the Father who created all things. For by his will they were created and have their being. We believe in God the Son who was slain. For with his blood he purchased us from every tribe and language, from every people and nation. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ said, Come, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Do please be seated for our confession. Christ, the light of the world, has come to dispel the darkness of our hearts, so let us turn to the light and confess our sins. Lord, we confess the things that hold us captive and keep us from you. Come and set us free from jealousy, pride, selfishness, materialism and apathy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, there are many times when we have failed to do good, and times when we've been silent instead of resisting evil. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Heavenly Father, you exalted the humble and meek. Give us humble and contrite hearts. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you grew toward birth in Mary's womb be planted also in our hearts and lives. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Holy Spirit, you overshadowed Mary, that she might bring Christ into our world. Fill us with your heavenly gifts. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. 
Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us the kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 So we continue in our intercession. To the phrase Maranatha, we respond, Come, Lord Jesus. So, in the <coughs> expectation of his coming, we pray to Jesus, saying, Maranatha, come, come, Lord Jesus. Come to your church as Lord and Judge. Overturn our lives as you overturn Mary's, that we may hear afresh the call to follow you. Open our eyes and our hearts to your new creation. And to the needs of others. Ignite in us a passion for justice and give us the courage to speak out for the poor, the oppressed and the outsider. Grant wisdom to those who lead, patience and strength to those who serve, and courage to those who challenge the world to live in the light of your judgment. Help us to live in the light of your coming and give us a longing for your will. Maranatha, come on, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Come to your will as King of the Jews. <coughs> we pray for those areas of the world which are locked in conflict and violence. For those suffering, particularly we think of the disaster in Gaza, of the long running sore of Yemen, to the people of Sudan and Ukraine. We pray for leaders who foment violence and aggression and those who obey them. For those who worship nationalism and pride above the needs of others. And we pray for those with the power to end or moderate violence, but who fail to do so for fear of the consequences for their politics. Father, change hearts and bring repentance and with it, peace to your world. We pray too for those who seek to hold before us the urgency of the climate crisis. We pray for our government and others. We pray for those who pass laws against protesters rather than face the impending disaster. And ask you that you, in your grace, give us leaders with courage, vision and wisdom. Bring repentance and a change of heart. But before you, rulers will stand in silence. Maranatha, come, come, Lord Jesus. Come to your people with a message of victory and peace. We pray for all who struggle with ill health, for those who seek to bring them healing. We pray for our own struggling health service and those who work in it. We pray for a settlement of ongoing pain disputes and a commitment to improvement of conditions for patients and staff. We pray to you today for those who are victims of abuse and prejudice. This morning we pray particularly for women serving in our armed forces and the misogyny and abuse they so often face. Wherever injustice and prejudice are entrenched, Shine the light of your hope and truth, and so give us the victory over death, temptation, and evil. Maranatha, come, come on, Lord Jesus. Go to us as Saviour and Comforter. We pray for those who mourn, and those who carry the burdens of guilt and regret. Reveal yourself as the one who reveals the hope of resurrection, who brings life out of death, and victory out of defeat. Break into our failure and distress and set us free to serve you forever. Maranatha. Come on, Lord Jesus. Come to us from heaven with power and great glory to lift us up to meet you with all your saints and angels and to live with you forever. Maranatha. Come on, Lord Jesus. We stand for our offertory hymn. 
Um, it's one that Marcus has requested, and I'm sure he's done it with you before. <laughs> Oh, 
servant in the Father's hands, filled with power and the Holy Spirit, filled with mercy for the broken man. Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain, joys and sorrows that I know so well. Yet his righteousness give me hope again. Thank <laughs> you. 